morning. Hi, everybody's caffeinated, clearly. <laughs> it's a wide room. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Big Ten Library Initiatives Annual Conference. I am delighted you're all here. I'm Kim Armstrong. I'm Director of Library Initiatives at the Big Ten Academic Alliance. And I'm, yes, <laughs> Big Ten. Um, this is probably our 15th, 16th annual conference, and it's a terrific tradition. And so I, I'm thrilled that you all get to be a part of it this year. I hope you had a fairly easy journey to Ann Arbor. Uh, it's a wonderful place to be, even if it's not spring in the Midwest right now. I want to thank the program committee uh, who've assembled a really top-tier roster of speakers for your program for the next day and a half. And I want to thank our hosts, the University of Michigan Libraries, for all their work on local arrangements and for the great event we're going to have tonight over at the library. In particular, I want to thank the library directors of the Big Ten Academic Alliance and our partner sponsors. They provide the support necessary for us to have the experience that we're going to have for the next day and a half. And I want you to know this conference happens by design. It, it is very intentional that each year the university librarians approve and decide on a topic that's important to research libraries, and we build a program around it. So there's no fixed state. Every year it's different. Every year it's topical, and it's designed uh, with these kinds of institutions in mind. But more than that, we reinforce the power of collaboration. Of our over 60 years of working together in the Big Ten, and each of you alone works at an exceptional university. Every one of you is, is, you know, you're not wearing your colors today, but every one of you works at a fantastic, terrific university. But together, together as the Big Ten, we have the opportunity for great impact, for great programs, and bringing great people together to advance our collective mission. And that's really why we built this conference, is for you all to get to know each other, to establish peer networks, to learn, to benchmark, to grow, by being together just as the Big Ten rather than a broader conference setting. So I hope you have a really productive couple of days with us. Let the staff know here, Big Ten, or uh, the awesome staff at this hotel, if you need anything. If you're not comfortable, if there's something that you need from us, let us know. And now I'm going to turn over the second welcome to James Hilton. James is Dean of Libraries and Vice Provost for Academic Innovation here at Michigan. And welcome, James, please. Good morning. Uh, so on behalf of all of my uh, library colleagues uh, here in Ann Arbor, uh, welcome to Ann Arbor and the University of Michigan. Uh, it is our pleasure to host the conference, and we're looking forward to uh, a really great conference. And if any of us can be helpful, just to echo Kim's words, just say the word and we'll do what we can to make your visit uh, uh, fun and uh, profitable in terms of learning about accessibility and things like that. I promise that I won't take too long here uh, talking. I'm just the warm-up act. Uh, and then people who know me are giggling because they say he's not going to take too long, but I really am going to try to do this very quickly. But I want to take just a few moments to sort of celebrate uh, the accessibility theme of this conference. And I want to do that uh, in two ways. Uh, first, I want to call your attention to some of the work that we've been doing here at U of M uh, that will be showcased in the reception this evening. Uh, like many of you, we've been working on accessibility in multiple ways, and this evening we'll highlight some of that work that's been done in the Shapiro Design Lab, in publishing, and in library environments. Uh, to give you just a taste, uh, the Shapiro Design Lab is an ever-evolving experimental space in the library focused on creating engaged learning opportunities and experiences across research, artistic, and teaching projects. Uh, this year, there was an explicit focus on the theme of open accessibility including investigations into 3D printing prosthetics, web accessibility checklists, algorithmic audio transcription, 3D printed tactile maps, and other interactive projects. Uh, in publishing, we've successfully changed editorial and production processes to publish fully accessible electronic books in our Disability Studies book series. Uh, and we're currently expanding our efforts to make accessibility a part of all of our publishing uh, publications and processes. 
Uh, and we've built and launched the Fulcrum publishing platform with accessibility as a core value of its design. Uh, our library environments department collaborates with library staff and our academic community to design and strategically develop adaptive staff and public spaces within the library, including renovations to existing space. Uh, its wayfinding team recently won a library diversity award for work on standardizing how we give inclusive and accessible directions throughout our, space, our spaces, uh, improving signage for accessibility, and set an example on campus for signage that makes it easier to locate accessible and all gender restrooms. Uh, it's all exciting work that goes to the heart of creating an inclusive and welcoming library. The second uh, way that I want to talk about accessibility a little bit in the theme of the conference is as a, as a growing number of people who, who know me here know that I've been, what's, uh, what's the word that I want to use? Um, Possessed is probably the right word. Um, uh, possessed uh, with a book entitled The End of Average. Uh, and if you haven't uh, read this book, I highly recommend it. Uh, uh, the basic thesis of the book is that the average, the notion of average, uh, permeates and shapes virtually all of our decisions, all of our interactions. If, for example, I tell you that women by the age of 25 on average report having kissed 15 people while men by the same age report on average having kissed 16 people or that in any given year people report on average having three colds my bet is that you have already compared yourself to those numbers and tried to figure out where you stand, right? It's almost automatic. We hear it, we compare, we try to think about averages. Um, uh, we're drawn like moths to a flame to make judgments about ourselves and others through a process where we aggregate across people to determine an average and use that average as a basis of judgment and design and everything else. Um, and to be clear, that approach is an improvement over a system based on nepotism or favoritism, but it falls far short of the personalized world we are entering. Why? Well, it turns out that in any group, no one actually matches the average. Uh, the average rarely describes any individual. So think about Air Force pilots. They are pre-select, they have been pre-selected for decades to resemble a certain size, a certain stature, right? Because cockpits were designed in a standard way. Uh, uh, but uh, as jets got more complicated, uh, they started having more and more crashes. So they did a study of 5,000 pilots who had been pre-selected. Uh, and they studied them across 10 different dimensions and then you could ask, what percentage of those pre-selected pilots were within 30% of the average across all 10 dimensions? And the answer was two out of 5,000. If you just went for five of the dimensions, the number is frighteningly small. So even when we aim for an average, nobody fits the average. But it's also true the other way. Even if it did capture a great number of people, the average doesn't, um, people don't want to be treated that way. So uh, cancer has, in general, been treated as an average approach. And you go to the doctor and you find out you have cancer, and the doctor says, I've got good news for you. 80% of the time, this treatment cures people. Well, that is good news, but it's not really what you want to know. What you really want to know is, is that treatment going to work for me, right? Not what does it work for on average. Uh, in the technology and data-rich world, impoverished that we've, world that we've been in, thinking about average was an improvement. But in the data and technology-rich world that we're headed to, it's probably not the best tool. And we're starting to see a rise in personalized approaches, um, which is really analyze and then aggregate 
understand individuals and patterns and then aggregate as opposed to aggregate right, and go with the average and then analyze, we're starting to see those approaches. So, for example, cockpits, the Air Force, after that study, turned around and said to manufacturers, you got to make cockpits adjust. you got to design cockpits that fit people, not pick people to fit cockpits, right? And the defense industry said, oh, my God, we can't do that. It's going to be too expensive. I mean, how could we possibly make a seat that adjusts? Where would we get, oh, well, wait, we've done that for cars. Pedals. Can't, bottom line, they started adjusting cockpits to people and the range of people who now fit in those cockpits and the accident rate and everything goes down. Medicine, everybody talks about personalized medicine. We're increasingly in a world where you're going to be informed, you're going to expect treatments that fit you and your genotype, not that fit the average person. Education, Right? I don't know how to break it to you, but most of our institutions still um, are perilously close to a factory model of education that says, here's a curriculum, here's a class. On average, this is what we expect people to do. You go through, oh, you learn at a different pace, in a different way. Well, we'll send you back through the line again and see if we can stamp you out right this time, right? That world is going to give away to personalized um, uh, worlds of education, and it's really excitement. Employment, HR processes, all of this, I think, is going to change to name just a few. So what does that have to do with accessibility? Well, I think it has uh, lots and lots to do with accessibility. And I told you I've been possessed. I'm really almost done. Um, I, to I told you I've been possessed by this, um, by this uh, book for the last couple of weeks. I have a provost who is pretty possessed by augmented reality and uh, what it's going to do to how we educate people. And so on Sunday, I was actually sitting in, in East Lansing at a performance of Hamilton. And my wife is a retired teacher of the hearing impaired, and so one of the things that I was doing was I was, I was watching the signers. Um, but the, the, the stage was here, and the signers were way over there. right? And I kept thinking, what a different experience they had what an average experience in some way they had because they could watch that or they could watch the stage. And again, I have a provost who's possessed with augmented reality. I went, oh, killer app, right? What I want are Google Glasses that are going to project the video of the signers just off center of my visual field so that wherever I look, I get both the information and the porn, right? Adapting to individual needs, not trying to aim for the average. So. The bottom line is, I love the notion of equitable access, the theme of this conference. Equitable can have nothing to do with average thinking. It provides an opportunity to, to, per, to personalize accessibility, a world where we strive to provide everyone with the best access that fits their lived experience. Right? Personalized accessibility. Uh, I offer that as something to think about as the conference goes through. I hope you have a great time, and uh, thank you for coming to Ann Arbor. <laughs> Rob's coming right now. All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Rob Van Rennes. I'm the Assistant Director for Library Initiatives at the Big Ten Academic Alliance. And our keynote speaker this morning is Jay Dolmage a professor of English and associate chair of the English department at the University of Waterloo. Jay is committed to disability rights in scholarship, service, and teaching. His work brings together rhetoric, writing, and disability studies. Jay has written several books on these subjects, including Disability Rhetoric, published by Syracuse University Press in 2014, Academic Ableism, Disability in Higher Education, published by Michigan University Press in 2017, and Disabled Upon Arrival, Eugenics, Immigration, and the Construction of Race and Disability, published in 2018 by the, the Ohio State University Press. He is also the founding editor of the Canadian Journal of Disability Studies. Will you please join me in welcoming Jay Dolmage. Thank you very much. So I just wanted to say a couple of things before I begin. I'm uh, a read from the pager, uh, mainly. 
Uh, but uh, hopefully there will be lots of space for interaction and for me to talk through some of the metaphors and images that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, I want people to use the space in whatever way they feel comfortable. So if that means getting up to get a drink or coffee or moving around, please do that. Um, there, the, there, is a di there are digital copies of my talks and slides and, and a lot of the resources that I talk about. They're going to be on a website and the address is Beyond Accommodation all one word, dot wordpress.com. And you can see that it's on the, the, the title slide here as well. Um, the other thing I want to say is uh, you all have little notebooks that we, you were given. If you want to ask questions anonymously, you can use that notebook, and I'll make time to gather those um, sheets. Often those are the best questions. And in fact, I'm going to make sure the first question I answer is one of those questions. Um, OK. Uh, so uh, the other thing I want to do is acknowledge that um, here in Ann Arbor, we're on the traditional territory of the Three Fires people. Um, that is the Ojibwe, the Ottawa, and the, Bo and the Botawadmi. Uh, I want to sort of engage with that because part of what I'm doing today is kind of mapping uh, academia, higher education. Thank you. Okay. So this first slide that I'm showing you, and the slides are projected over here and here, these are steep steps. This is the McKeldin Library at the University of Maryland. It's a red brick building. It has white columns in the front. Um, there's a set of stairs that lead through up through the center of the building. So there are exterior stairs that seem to go through a kind of courtyard that lead up to another set of stairs that lead into the library. And it's this uh, idea of steep stairs that I want to give to you as the first legend on my map, the first metaphor that I want to use. I would imagine that your campuses like mine at the University of Waterloo are lousy with stairs. My own campus is a lot of brutalist architecture, so big concrete stairs kind of ruffling out left and right. Uh, it doesn't look good in the rain or the snow, uh, which is pretty much all it does in Waterloo. <laughs> um, so I, I want to talk about these stairs and, and have you hold this idea of steep stairs, and maybe you can, you can picture or... Um, sort of uh, think about stairs that you traverse in your own um, movement across campus. Uh, I think that, that steep stairs like this exclude students with disabilities from the key aesthetic, cultural, artistic, and intellectual centers and messages of university life. And that's not just traditional stairs like these ones at McKeldin. So I'm showing another slide here. This is, these are stairs in the interior of, Ohio, of uh, the Ohio State University library, and what we see are steel and glass, it's a very steel and glass um, uh, library, and there's an atrium in the middle of the library, and these steps are cantilevered out into the atrium, so they go out and then back into the atrium. I don't like heights, I would have a really hard time with these stairs. But again, this is a new, it's a, a very modern building, and again, the key aesthetic statement of the space is oriented around stairs, around steps. Um, Okay, so uh, final image. is This is Northwestern's Kellogg School of Business. And this is a new trend. So it, it happens as well in famous libraries like the um, 53rd Street Library in New York City. Um, but these are stairs as collaboration spaces. So I'll, I'll read a description here um, from a, a news article about these stairs. Um, this Northwestern's Kellogg Business School houses, quote, what may be the mother of all bleacher stairs, two long flights of wide wood stairs that run from the building's lower level to its second floor. Since the building's March opening, the stairs have become a hot spot where future business executives eat, study, talk, or type away on their laptops. This is called Collaboration Plaza for a reason, said Matt Merrick, an associate dean, as he overlooked the atrium. The lively scene is no accident. Like the Spanish steps, which famously link two piazzas, the atrium's bleacher stairs connect a multitude of activities from cafes to classrooms on the building's lower floors. The result is an indoor town square, a beating heart for a building that otherwise might have had no visible pulse. So again, these are new stairs, but this, this metaphor of being the beating heart, the center of, of, of the space, I think it gets at the idea that whether we're looking at old marble staircases or new glass and steel ones or these, this kind of atrium space, the stairs structure the aesthetic, the cultural, 
um, the intellectual message that a university wants to send. That's the first image that we're working with. This is the second image, which is a, the second um, uh, piece of the, the legend for my talk, and that is a retrofit. So when we have steep stairs, we often have a retrofitted solution. So if, the, if we have a beautiful marble staircase in the front, we have a really crappy ramp in the back. And it usually comes through a freight entrance, maybe um, uh, through a kitchen, right? You might have to come and find another uh, stair lift or a small elevator that takes you up a few stairs. And the point is to get to access the same things, you have to come around the back or in the side. So this image shows a retrofit, from, the, and this is from the, uni the, the University of Illinois Library Archives. So this is, it's, it's a, a, steel, a steel and concrete ramp that's very steep. It's a switchback ramp. Um, and it takes, takes uh, there are two individuals on the ramps, bo both in uh, wheelchairs. But I would imagine that this is no longer up to, uh, up to spec. The point about being up to spec, however, says that a, that a space needs to be accessible, but to a minimal standard. And you can imagine, if we were just talking about being the beating heart of campus, what kind of message this is. Uh, it's not central. Um, and, it, and it's not artistic and it's not part of the culture and the lore of university lives, of, of university life. Okay, so that's the retrofit. Uh, the third piece, this is also from the University of Illinois Archives. At first, you probably won't associate this with universal design. But what we see, this is the actual shed where they were, the Disability Division of Rehabilitation and Educational Services of, of, at the University of Illinois, which was actually a really path-breaking office. So they did student services through this office, so disabled students could come and, and, and get the accommodations that they needed, but they also did a ton of research into how to build spaces more inclusively. And the ramp in front here that leads to nowhere, that's kind of a metaphor too, but <laughs> the ramp was actually used to test what the best inclines would be and how much effort students would need to use to get up different inclines. So it was a way of thinking about the, the, the ramp itself as uh, an architectural piece, but also as something that needed to be user tested uh, if it was going to become central to the redesign of space. And there were tons of um, experiments that were performed just like this at the University of Illinois, which took a universal design principle, which was that all space could be designed for the broadest range of possible users. And that if you're going to redesign space for that broad range of users, you needed to involve those users in testing how that space was going to be built. So those are my three metaphors, steep steps, retrofit, and universal design. I'm going to talk a little bit more. About, I'll give you one more example of universal design. This is the Museum of Human Rights in Winnipeg, Canada. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a big uh, a stone and steel structure that looks a little bit like a big snail. Uh, a lot of kind of a winding um, uh, architecture on the outside. and on the, and you see that the main entrance to the space, it has a ramp right up, and the, everybody comes through the space in the same way. This is a, a, an image of the inside of the space, and these are these crisscrossing ramps. There are no stairs in the space. There are just ramps that bring people from place to place. And the architects involved in building the space, they saw that as being the circulation system of the space, so kind of like the heart. Uh, there is a way to, 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 to build accessibility into an aesthetic statement um, that fits with something like a museum of human rights. Okay. All right. So, I want to talk a little bit more about the steep steps. Because I think the steep steps are more than just, and I'm showing the McKeldin Library here again, um, they're not just things we find on campus. They're a metaphor for higher education and for academic life. The steep steps kind of physically but also figuratively lead to the ivory tower. And this tower is built upon standards. In many ways, it's, a, it's this, an identity that, uni that the university has embraced. Um, I think we've mapped the university this way as a, as a climb up a set of steep stairs for particular reasons. The steep steps metaphor sums up the ways the university constructs spaces that exclude. Not only have people with disabilities been traditionally seen as objects of study in higher education, rather than as teachers or students, not only has disability been a rhetorically produced stigma, which could be applied to other marginalized groups to keep them out of the university, 
But the university is seen as performing the societal and cultural function of pulling some people slowly up the stairs as it arranges others at the bottom. So it's no surprise to me that when, when they made a movie like Monsters University, people seen that movie? If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. It's a, it's a terrific uh, critique of higher education. But when they made the, the movie, the Pixar animators, they went and studied Stanford, University of Michigan, Harvard. They looked at these traditional older campuses to build the backdrop for this film. What's really interesting is that then you take the most traditional of possible ideas of campus and you drop a whole bunch of monsters in, bodies that don't fit. Um, so there's a scene at the beginning of the movie with a, a, a snail or a slug, and everybody is rushing to get to class. You can hear these sort of bells ringing and everybody's rushing to get to class. The slug is rushing, but not making it very quickly, right? And I think that's such a powerful metaphor. The, move, the entire movie happens and ends. The final scene of the movie over the credits, we see that the snail is still there and hasn't made a whole lot of progress. And that could have been a semester, but it also might have been a year. Um, the other thing for me that's interesting about that is that, and I study really bad movies about higher education a lot as well, but in almost all of these movies, do you, do you know what happens at the end? They drop out. The heroes drop out. They don't graduate. They leave. And I think that's something that we should think very carefully about. And in Monsters University, they leave because they're misfit for this elitist life. And it's a critique of the false meritocracy of higher education. And I think that in, in an era of, of, of populist politics, we should care very much that a lot of people see universities as spaces for manufacturing, not merit, not equitable access, but as places where access is portioned out in an inequitable way. And, and the truth is, disability is a big part of this. Um, you know, very recently the, the CDC told us that one-fifth of the population in the United States is disabled. Uh, and I think because of this, we all need to care about disability. Anywhere from 6 to 9% of undergraduate students report having a disability. So that's a huge difference, from 20% down to 6 to 9. Some universities have numbers as low as 3% of the student population uh, seeking accommodations. So there's a big gap right there. Okay? And I think we should assume that many students with disabilities are on our campuses and in our classrooms, but doing everything they can to avoid uh, acknowledging that disability because of the stigma that comes along with it. Uh, so, so, sorry. Um, the, da, 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 da. Give me one second here. Uh, the other big piece of this, so, okay, uh, I'll, I'll sort of summarize this, this uh, research really quickly. Um, the best number I can give you is this. So, students with learning disabilities at the K-12 to level, if you have a learning disability at the K-12 level, 90% of those individuals seek an accommodation. 91, 92%. Only 13% of those same students, when they come to university, seek an accommodation. So the very thing that most likely helped somebody get into university or college or university, that accommodation, as soon as they get into higher education, they don't seek that same accommodation. And we know that, people in this room understand that Disability is in part constructed by how we teach. It's in part constructed by the environment. Higher education is not less constructive of disability. But people are avoiding seeking accommodation for as long as they can. This means that students with disabilities graduate with much higher debt than other students. Uh, there's something so different about the culture of K-12 and the culture of higher education that that many students are not seeking accommodations. I know that these are probably things that you all know and see, but I think part of my job today is in helping you marshal together the arguments that we need to make together to say that A, higher education is ableist, and that B, there's a, there's a real cost to this ableism. I think the truth is you get what you pay for. So the average operating budget of disability services offices in North America is $257,000 a year. That gets you a really low-level assistant football coach. And there are more and more low-level assistant football coaches hired every year. 
and these budgets are not increasing at the same rate. So you also have a situation in which these offices are working above capacity and may have kind of implicit restraints or in incentives to minimize the supports that they can offer. I think as a key part of this discussion at the conference, we have to acknowledge that not all of the information on university campuses is accessible e either. And this includes a lot of what we might hopefully call open access. So, you know, the data is a little bit old, but this is from 2007. A huge sample of government and education websites, uh, only 45% of these pages even use text equivalents to describe visual elements and images, and only 50% follow HTML standards, and only 24% pass basic navigational criteria. As Brewer, Self, and Yergo argue, we have not as yet taken on the professional responsibility of making sure that all texts are easily readable. This is also true, of course, of many digital texts. And I would suggest thinking about the retrofit again. What would, so one experiment that, that we can think of is, do people, do people ever read the Family Circus cartoons? Uh, it's kind of dating me, maybe. But Family Circus cartoons are about a family, and there was a, there's a, a common, you know, like a Sunday Family Circus cartoon would be a, a kind of two-panel spread in which one of the kids comes to the parents at the beginning of the panel and says, there's nothing to do, I'm bored. And then it actually shows through the footsteps everything that a child gets up to in a, in a given weekend day um, by sort of tracing their pathway all around the, their yard and, and neighborhood. Uh, I think the retrofit, so and I'll show the, the slide again of the retrofitted ramp from University of Illinois. If we were to actually chart the path that we need to use to move across campus using only accessible entrances, it would be much like that cartoon. There's a sense in which certain bodies don't fit, just like that snail, and thus they're kind of marked out for wearing out through the ways they have to move through campus to access the same things that other people get through the front entrance. So um, my suggestion then is what if we were to try this experiment for a day? Only use accessible entrances at your workplace. Only open doors with buttons, take no stairs, and so on. By the end of the day, you would fully feel and see how poorly designed our academic spaces are. Then, do the same experiment online by navigating your library and institution web pages using only your keyboard and no mouse for a day. See how much work you can get done. And I'd suggest that then we would understand that these steep steps and the ill-fitted retrofits um, are not just physical. They're as real online as they are on campus. So, uh, <laughs> thank you. Just as a thought experiment, if some of you have, have um, note paper in front of you, some of you are working on tablets. But one thing we could do, and I'm a terrific artist, so I'll show you how I'll do it. Um, get ready to have your mind blown here. This is how I would draw steep steps. I could do a 3D version, but it would be, take me too long. So these are just steps, you know, leading from the right to the left up the page. And you could think of this as kind of like a graph as well. But I want you to think just for a minute or as, as a way to, to, to hold on to this idea. For you in your own movement through academia, what have these steps felt like? How have you experienced them? I think what, what myths do we have about what gets us up these steps? Right? The idea is that it's hard work and individual self-determination, right? Or that there's some innate, something innate in us that brings us up these stairs. But I also think there are forces pushing backwards and that we don't all start on the same step. And I do think it's useful then to think about our own trajectory. What are the things that helped us get up these steps? How do we help other people navigate these steps every day through our work? How do we reinforce these steps through the work that we do? And if we don't want to reinforce these steps, what are the ramps we can create? What are the retrofits that we can work with? Okay. So the retrofit, I think, is, is a metaphor that a lot of you will be familiar with. How many people in here have done work making previously inaccessible uh, information accessible? Okay. So this is your bread and butter. 
Uh, I think the, the issue with retrofits is that much of the time, the message of a retrofit is that the main space won't change. Having a ramp around the back means you don't have to change the stairs at the front. I also think that the logic of the retrofit many times is that it's minimal, that you're getting things up to a minimal standard and that that's it. The retrofit stops there. Um, I think in a way the retrofit can be a kind of cure for disability but a half-hearted one. So it begins by negating disability and ends up only partially succeeding, leaving people with disabilities in difficult positions. And I'll use the metaphor of the accommodations model on university campuses because some of you may be familiar with that. So students describe the accommodation model in a couple of different ways. And I'll use game metaphors to describe this. So the one piece that, that the accommodation model, the one piece of logic that it relies on is that it's like Las Vegas. What happens for the one student in one class stays with that one student in that one class. And that becomes part of the negotiation and disclosure that students are forced to, to go through over and over again. That they have to get new diagnoses, that they have to create relationships with people who have a lot of power over them over and over by disclosing disability or by putting disability first. It also says to instructors that they shouldn't change what they do as teachers. That the, the accommodations they make for individual students shouldn't necessarily be things that they apply across the board or that they move forward. It's kind of like the game Whack-A-Mole, if people played Whack-A-Mole. The idea is when a disability pops up, you smack it with an accommodation and you hope that it goes away. That's the way Whack-A-Mole works. There's these little moles that pop up and you get to hit them with hammers. Uh, but I think that's very much the logic uh, when we have an accommodation process in which we don't acknowledge that somewhere in between 15 and 20% of the people with disabilities on our campuses are not even using the accommodation model. Um, the other metaphor that, that students use is that it's like the game Battleship. Have people played the game Battleship? So Battleship is a game where you have a board and there's a screen, so you can't see the player, the, the things on the other side of the board. Um, and students talk about coming into the Disability Services Office and they get... Uh, they disclose a diagnosis and they throw that diagnosis over the screen and they hope that it lands on the other side on an accommodation that will actually help them. But they don't know what those accommodations are. It's very risky to throw a diagnosis over that screen. Um, and the truth is, on the other side, there's not that much. Somewhere between 75 and 90% of the accommodations that happen on university campuses are extended time on tests and exams. There is, no there is no good research that shows that time tests and exams help students learn anymore. In fact, all the research shows that the lower around time tests and exams, that it makes students study harder or retain more because of the stress involved, none of it's true. And yet, we think of that small university uh, disability accommodations budget, 75 to 90 percent of that budget is, is taken up on time tests and exams. And it gets to the comments we had to introduce today. We're stuck in this Fordist industrial model of education, and so many resources are put into that model. And I think the retrofit accommodation process fits that logic per per perfectly. Okay. And I, so what I, say to, what I say to faculty all the time is that there are very few faculty who brag about giving time tests and exams or want to believe that that's the, their main function. In fact, you, you all probably work with faculty all the time who are really innovative teachers, and they're moving away completely from that model. Part, those instructors can be part of the problem, too. So, for instance, I teach small writing classes. I never give time tests and exams, and I never lecture. But if I keep taking those accommodations, right, and saying, oh, I don't need to do anything, then that battleship game becomes more complicated because the Office of Disability Services is throwing accommodations over that don't match what I do in the classroom. I have some responsibility to take the screen down and say, these are not going to work. I don't give time-tested exams. I do collaborative work. I do peer review. Uh, I do experiential learning. I have some responsibility then to make sure that those teaching processes are accessible as well. Continuing to, to work within this model and patting myself on the back and saying that I don't need to change anything, it's closer to what we might call like malicious compliance, 
right? Where we keep doing something even though we know it's exacerbating the problem. And I think that's where a lot of people in this room can come in and be part of the solution, is thinking through not how do we keep adjusting and fixing this old Fordist education model that we want to critique, but instead, if we can make this new and more innovative teaching that we're doing, if we can actually think about accommodations that make it more accessible, then we have the opportunity to kind of re revolutionize what we're doing with teaching. I'll, I'll give you one more retrofit example that some of you may have some, some direct experience with. If you want to get an accessible ar a format of an article for a student, if that article is published by Routledge or Taylor and Francis in non-open access, expensive and very proprietary journals, you have to join a disturbingly euphemistic club called Academic VIPs. Disclose the student's name and the fact that they have a visual or physical impairment or a learning difficulty. Then there are a long series of legal provisions and rules. There doesn't appear to be any provision at all for a faculty member with a disability seeking accessible formats, though we can assume that they would also be compelled to disclose their disability. Not only is access not open in such a scheme, it's very expensive, but the disabled person is forced to disclose disability or the teacher is forced to extend access as an act of charity or stewardship. And this is very much how that retrofit model works. So this is exactly how Routledge and Taylor and Francis position accessibility for their approximately 2,200 journals. This can then give us a baseline for, for access. A huge chunk of scholarly publishing is both uh, expensive and inaccessible, ensuring that this dis discourse circulates easily only through certain bodies. When disabled people need access to these texts, this can be provided only through the bodies of the more able and privileged. This is how much of the time a retrofit works. Okay, so I want to suggest we're still going to be working with an accommodations model on university campuses. There's still a huge amount of inaccessible information that we need to make accessible and the retrofit can be a way to do that. But we're, I'm dealing with a kind of three bear scenario as you could probably already tell. Hopefully I'm getting to like the right temperature of porridge uh, or if it's a three pigs, maybe the bricks. And that's universal design. So, and I think universal design then offers us a more uh, progressive way to plan for, the, for, uh, for instance, plan for higher education in which students can claim disability as an identity, uh, in, which, in which students can have access through the front door. So uh, universal design, which many of you are going to be familiar with, it's a, a movement that first came from architecture and has been adapted to learning or pedagogical outcomes. Basically, there are three main tenets of universal design for learning. And this is what the slide says. One is multiple means of representation to give learners various ways of acquiring information and knowledge. And so that means giving a talk, having electronic version, having handouts, having slides, reading the slides aloud. One of the best things about universal design is what I call positive redundancy. And I have three small children and I use positive redundancy all the time. And that is just the idea that it never hurts to say things more than once and in more than one way. Uh, the one metaphor I give with that is um, doorknobs. So there used to just be one kind of doorknob and you needed to reach and twist it in a particular direction and then pull or push the door. That was it. Well, we don't make doorknobs like that anymore. Not in public space. We now have doors that I can, when I have my hands full, hit with my butt, right? Or my knee or knock down with my elbow. Uh, and that's just positive redundancy. It's the idea that there are many ways to get through the door. If the goal is to get through the door, there need to be multiple ways to get through it because people are going to use that door differently. That's positive redundancy, which is a universal design tenet. The other thing that the, the doorknob does is it has what's called tolerance for error. If the goal is to get through the door, there should be no scenario in which I smack my head against the door. Right? It should open for me you know, no matter how I try to use it. Uh, so that's the, the other piece uh, uh, is tolerance for error. Okay, multiple means of expression then in the second tenet, which is just providing learners alternatives for demonstrating what they know. And the way that I talk about this with faculty is I say, I'm going to come back to your office in 50 minutes and I'm going to collect a publishable article. I'm just kidding, I don't actually say that. <laughs> so it would make people panic, right? But that's how we teach so much of the time. 50-minute chunks, 
We expect students to, to be able to deliver their best ideas within those chunks of time or to retain the kind of active learning that we want them to do. So if the goal is to have the, all the students in the room learning and contributing to a conversation that furthers knowledge, 50-minute chunks aren't going to be very good. That's not going to give students multiple means for expressing what they know. I'm old enough that I began, when I began teaching, people were just beginning to experiment with message boards. And I would teach, and there would be two students in every class who had terrible body language. It seemed like they hated me, and they hated the class. So I would spend 16 weeks just gently trying to pull something out of those two students. When I started moving conversations in class over to message boards, those two students, in general, had a ton to say on the message boards. And I realized giving multiple means for people to take part meant that those students actually had huge contr contributions to make to the classroom. And that the way that I was structuring things where students could only just put their hands up meant that I wasn't going to get all of, the, all, all of that contribution out of those students. And the way that I think of that is that that's a huge waste of intellectual potential that those students have important things to contribute. I'll give one more example with that. Um, do you all remember getting participation marks in university classes? Nobody ever says what participation marks are actually given for. And sometimes it's 15 to 20 percent of the grade. And I know, and I'll admit to it, for many years I gave participation grades. At the end of the term, I would just sort of like have this nebulous process where I'd think, was that person there? Were they engaged, right? Totally subjective. And it was usually based on the students who put their hands up the most. Well, I kind of now understand that the students who put their hands up the most, they're not actually contributing that much. In fact, they're taking away sometimes almost as much as they're contributing. So I changed participation grades. And I said, you tell me what you're going to do to participate. And I gave a larger menu of things that students could do beyond simply putting their hands up. So students do a reflection in my class now twice a semester, and they say, this is what I've done to participate. And I keep learning new ways to positively participate in class. I have a student, and maybe one of their parents is really into like Robert's Rules of Order, but they take minutes in class, terrific minutes, and then they share them. That's awesome, because when students email me and say, I miss class what did I miss? The minutes are there. It's also a mirror held up to the class for me. I learn what did I actually teach? What did students actually get from things? That is a huge contribution, and then I can reward that student for that participation. It's just a better doorknob for teaching, right, to have that. So, again, it's multiple means of expression, and then finally, multiple means of engagement to tap into their interests, offer appropriate challenges, and increase motivation. And I would say that example of the participation a much more detailed and various and diverse way for students to participate. It offers all of those things. Okay. All right. So, uh, the other thing that I'll say about universal design, uh, there's, a, there's a concept, and some of you all may be familiar with it, but it's called the electronic curb cut effect. People heard of this before? You know what a curb cut is. Uh, I'm old enough that I remember writing letters when people would build sidewalks without curb cuts and you'd write a letter to the city and say you need to put a curb cut in here. But now, that's just how sidewalks are designed. You don't have a sidewalk at a stoplight that doesn't have curb cuts on all four corners. It's actually cheaper. It takes less concrete. Right? But it's also just good design. And it has it effects not just for people in wheelchairs. It's better for people with strollers. It's better for people... Anyone who's walking, there's less tripping. It's good for skateboarders. There's all these different people that it's good for. And that's that curb cut effect. And when you do something for people with disabilities, it has unforeseen positive outcomes for everybody. The digital curb cut effect is the idea that, how many of you have a smartphone? Every single cool thing that your smartphone does was originally a niche technology just for people with disabilities from email to GPS, uh, optical character recognition, text-to-speech, speech-to-text, all of those things for a period of time were really expensive, really narrow things just for disabled people. 
And we, we come to understand that that thing that was done as an adaptive technology became what had unforeseen consequences for everybody. Okay. Uh, so I want to say then, as I kind of wrap up here, um, I want to link this idea of universal design and accessibility and that broad sense of who we're designing for to open access. Uh, and I want to sort of isolate one specific example of where accessibility and design come together, and that is through open access publishing. Uh, I think that we could agree in the room that open access publishing holds a promise of fostering an inclusionary and egalitarian networked commons. OA publishing can create an environment in which decisions over the publication and distribution of research can be made not by the market, but according to other criteria, not least its intellectual value and quality. So I want to suggest that open access publishing should allow us to draw more attention to the accessibility of text for a broad audience with varying abilities and needs. And it's a perfect opportunity for universal design. But I worry that without careful intervention, we're simply recreating unnecessary steep stairs in our movement to democratize the movement of knowledge and information. And I'll bring you back to the slide that showed these steep steps in the Northwestern Kellogg School of Business. That, to me, is a perfect metaphor for how steep steps get built back into open access. So we have this idea that we're creating this democratic and collaborative space, right? a progressive space where exchange of ideas can happen in ways that aren't constrained by tradition, just like in the, on these steps. But they're played out, these, these egalitarian goals are played out across the same type of inaccessible space. So the Bethesda statement suggests that open access means anyone can access research on the public internet for free and, quote, copy, use, distribute, transmit, and display the work publicly and to make and distribute derivative works in any digital medium. Open access also centers the philosophy of the human right to know and right to be known. Whether defined simply as free or further distinguished as an alternative economic model, the key, to finding, the key to defining the access in OA has hinged on money. The cost barrier is removed. And I think this should really matter to all of us. Um, but, and, and removing that financial or resource barrier certainly does make open access scholarship more accessible. But working kind of forwards from that, uh, we should kind of dis disentangle the concepts of access and accessibility. In, in my own field, we look to Jim Porter to define the distinction between these terms. In his words, it's important to distinguish between access and accessibility, overlapping terms that nonetheless refer to dis distinct spheres of concern. Access is the more general term related to whether a person has a necessarily hardware, software, and network connectivity in order to use the internet, and to whether certain groups of persons have a disadvantaged level of access due to their race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, gender, age, or other factors. Accessibility refers to the level of co connectedness of one group of persons, those with disabilities, and the reason to write or design for accessibility is not only to allow people with disabilities to consume information, but to help them to produce it. Okay, so we see this kind of overlap when, when we have conflicts around things like uh, open access educational resources. We know that uh, the U.S. Department of Education determined that thousands of hours of video teaching uh, materials, 20,000 course videos hosted by UC Berkeley were not accessible. And the solution, as some of us in the room know, was that Berkeley simply yanked down the videos from public facing sites rather than captioning them. The clear message was that accessibility is not worth it. And I think that the implicit message is that the mandate for accessibility spoils things for everyone else. It gets back to this idea of students with disabilities in general. So I notice on my own campus that every single thing we pay for, whether it's carpeting and air conditioning uh, to student support services, they're all seen as investments. But the things we do for students with disabilities are seen as a drain on resources. Students with disabilities are not constructed as having the same intellectual potential as regular students. And that's the inherent ableism that, that makes this fight for access so difficult. I think we should be framing, for instance, this large group of disabled students who aren't seeking accommodations at all 
I think if we could have data on the retention and graduation rates of those students, we'd be shocked. And I think that is a huge waste of intellect and potential that gets reproduced and reinforced when, for instance, we do things like yank these videos down rather than captioning them. And the message is that things that we do for disabled students are a drain on resources and everything else is an investment. Okay, so I do have some suggestions about some baselines for open access and accessibility. And I think the great thing, I'm looking forward to, to, to the rest of the day today, to learning how you all develop these kinds of principles and how you build them into what you do. The first, first argument I want to make is that when we're designing for accessibility, we need to give bodies the same attention we give to algorithms. I work at a university that has a huge computer science department, one of the best computer science programs in the world. When I look for RAs who could help me come and code accessible HTML, I can't find anybody. It's a huge program, wonderful program, and they're not teaching accessibility as a baseline. They're spending a huge amount of time teaching students how to write code that will be easily read by algorithms. They're not spending much time teaching students how to write code that could be read by a wide range of human bodies. So that's one principle. Um, okay. Give bodies the same attention we give to algorithms. And that means, you know, like caring as much about access as we do about advertising. Okay. The other piece, I think, is that equivalency does not equal equity. Uh, there's a terrific book by a scholar named Sean Zdenek, uh, and I'm going to forget the name of the book right now. Oh, shoot. It's all about captioning. It's all about the rhetoric of captioning. And what Sean does in this book is basically goes through all of these terrific examples, rich examples, where especially captioning of videos for movies and television shows does such a terrible job. And one of the best examples that he gives is um, he looks at a bunch of, and again, I'm going to show my age, but like John Hughes movies from the 80s, like wonderful movies like uh, Pretty in Pink, Breakfast Club. These movies, their soundtracks mattered so much. The music that was playing in the lyrics mattered so much. Question? Awesome. Yes, Reading Sounds is the name of the book, and I highly recommend it. Um, but the captions for these films, they just say music playing, right? So that's an equivalency, but it robs people of so much of the central meaning of a scene um, to just say music playing. Uh, okay, so again, equivalency does not equal equity. For any graphic, visual, or audio information from charts to video ch clips to images, we need to offer text e equivalents within the digital files. A research paper presenting charted data must also offer text interpretation of the visual information conveyed, especially when something like an infographic is being used. The authors and editors may even find that providing these text equivalents helps them to better interpret and communicate the ideas the chart was intended to convey for all audiences. And I do this with students all the time in asking them to compose multi multimodal text or multimedia text. They have to do the equivalencies from the beginning. And that helps them clarify what they're trying to do rhetorically and what they want the audience to get from what they're showing. For instructors who are showing a lot of slides, when they have to give a, a visual description of the slide, what they're actually also doing is teaching the audience how to read that information by speaking it aloud. It's like the doorknob. It's like the electronic curb cut effect. That thing that you do that you think you're just doing for access is actually enriching the information that you're, you're giving. And it's going to have unforeseen positive consequences beyond just doing what you're supposed to do, which is make it available. Okay? And then the final thing is this idea that all texts are translations of translations waiting to be translated. And for English lit people, that's kind of an Octavio Paz quote repurposed. Uh, but the idea that um, content developers should use markup um, to signal a document's natural language, and when natural language is changed within a document, to, uh, to speech synthesizers and braille devices cannot, can then automatically switch to the new language so long as it's po properly marked up. Content developers can also provide expansions of abbreviations and acronyms 
We know we should do that. And as W3 guidelines show, natural language markup, quote, also improves readability of the web for all people, including those with learning disabilities, cognitive disabilities, or people who are deaf. So the things that we think of as static text can and should be seen as utterable. Um, that's a way to kind of signal the performative nature of what we're doing. In particular, this, this, uh, these practices and perspectives should help us foresee and compose for the inevitable shifting of print to auditory, visual, and even tactile iterations and the bodies desiring these formats. So making a text easily translatable across languages also makes it more accessible. Okay. I want to get, give time for questions, and clearly there's lots of work to do. I want to signal um, a couple of things. One, my book is available open access uh, through the University of Michigan's Fulcrum site. On the website as well, I've listed a whole long range of things that we can do right now to increase accessibility and to combat academic ableism on college campuses. So the first thing that I suggest, if you haven't already read it, is to read the ethical framework for library publishing. As the framework suggests, addressing accessibility is not simply a way to avoid litigation, but a fundamental access of, uh, aspect of equitable access. In the higher education environment, open access advocates and library publishers have fallen short in making materials accessible at a time when technology offers opportunities to reach people in unprecedented ways. I also suggest that as a, as a um, uh, addendum to my book, I've got a list of hundreds of universal design teaching activities. So for those of you who work uh, with uh, instructors or, or building pedagogical tools, it's a bad metaphor, but I hope that you can be kind of evangelical about this or like um, uh, the idea is that if you can get people to start with one universal design idea, even if it's like my participation idea, they'll see that there are these unforeseen consequences and they'll try more. It's like a gateway drug. I guess you're all like dealers in that <laughs> bad metaphor. Um, okay. The other thing uh, that I want to point you towards is, um, is uh, well, the, I'll, I'll, leave these, I'll leave these resources up on the website. Um, the other thing I'll say is that University of Michigan and the University of Michigan Libraries have been involved in, in these guidelines for accessible publishing. Those are up on the site. And also uh, uh, involved in more um, detailed and kind of granular practices for things of doing things like describing visual resources within a text. Um, so we're beginning to build out these guidelines, right? Beginning to, to build out these, these ways of pressuring university publishers uh, to, to do things more accessibly. And hopefully there's lots of people in the room today, the ways that we can collaborate with one another to help make those things more fulsome. Thank you very much. So I, th I think we have about 10 minutes for questions. If there are anonymous questions, you could hand those forward and maybe I would try to answer one of those. But we can do hands up questions too. <laughs> At the back? Yes. Yeah. Hold on, we'll bring the microphone to you. Right here. Robert, right Where? over there. Oh, okay. <laughs> of course, it's me. AJ. Um, so you talked a lot about students, which I'm really appreciative because we largely are student focused people. But can you talk a little bit about disability and accessibility on the other side mm -hmm. for professors, for faculty and staff, um, and the gap yeah. in how universities are addressing the needs of those people that work for universities versus how, yeah, how accessibility and disability needs are being met for students? Absolutely. Yeah, it's a, a couple of the resources on on the site address that directly. There's an article that I co-authored called It Shouldn't Be So Hard, which is basically about the hiring process for faculty with disabilities. But I think it gets at that, that kind of imaginary sense of what higher education is, that it has a, there's, a, there's a, enough of a struggle to imagine disabled students, and universities hardly ever imagine disabled staff or faculty. My own university has taken seven years of battling to even have a policy on accommodation for faculty, and many other universities are in that same boat. 
So there's a very regimented, like overly regimented process for students. There's very little for staff or faculty. Um, and graduate students often f fall into the gaps even worse than, than staff and faculty do. Uh, and I, because I think it's that, it's that imagine, it's, it's that inability to imagine that universities would have disabled people. I think you get to, uh, you know, if you look at an accessible class, how a classroom is made accessible, almost always, you know, think of those, uh, um, uh, what, what's the right word? It's not coming to me. Uh, classrooms that have the, the kind of like um, <laughs> stadium style seating. Okay, the accessible seats are going to be for a couple of wheelchairs at the very back. The least accessible space in that classroom is at the front. There's no sense of imagining that a disabled faculty member would be the teacher, the professor, right? So I think that's a big piece of it. And the lack of processes in place become part of that problem. But of course, 20% of university faculty and staff are going to be disabled, just like in the regular world. And if you don't build the pro processes to welcome them and make them s feel like they are assets and, and part, part of the culture, then we're going to lose those people and we're going to lose that potential. Um, so I'd be happy to talk to people even on a more individual basis about how they're dealing with this on their campuses because I think a lot of times people are locked in that kind of uh, negotiation. Um, but the truth is, the other thing I'll say about disability, this will sound kind of strange, but it's not, it's not a set identity category. And I think any large um, employer like a university should assume that every staff and faculty member will have some experience with disability over the course of their career. And that, that good organizations plan for that because they want people to be there for the long term. They don't want disability to be the thing that makes somebody leave their position. So... Uh, yeah, but that said, even on my own campus, we're, we're, it's been seven years of fighting to even have a policy. And before that, people were just encouraged to go talk to their chair or their dean, which of course we know is unacceptable. That's somebody who has so much control over your career. Um, to force a disclosure to that kind of person is, is not acceptable. And so then people just weren't disclosing and not getting the accommodations they needed. Thank you. Um, I'd like to piggyback on what she was saying. Uh, in most cases, as far as I understand, students are part of the uh, disabled students are part of the budget for accommodation. Um, however, staff and faculty tend not to be at universities, and it's up to the department to fund any other kind of accommodations for them, which is another level of um, barrier that exists for engaging those disabled faculty and staff members. Um, I would encourage people to reach out to their um, student disability services or their uh, resource departments for disability services and um, talk with them about what their ability to engage <coughs> disabled people on campus actually looks like to get a better sense of um, what they're working with on their own campus. Um, and I'd also like to thank you for uh, speaking to you some real truths for me. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to say that model is wrong. That just it exists over and over again, right? Where the, the budget for accommodation comes out of like the same budget as like uh, food at department meetings, right? And that's, it's a human rights violation and it's a lawsuit waiting to happen, right? So again, I'm glad to talk with people individually about this, but this is the battle we're fighting on my campus. And it's, the battle is, sounds quite simple, but the fact that we're still fighting for it, to have a central, central funding for accommodations so that nobody's, uh, accommodation needs are weighed against a speaker series uh, or photocopying. Uh, it's, it, so, and to have a, have a way in which people are not forced to disclose to the people who, who immediately govern their, um, their career. And universities shouldn't want that. Uh, I mean, if, if, if someone discloses a disability and then is denied tenure, that is a lawsuit. So universities are very lawsuit averse. Um, but this seems to be an area in which uh, these kinds of things continue to happen. And it's really unfortunate. And I just want to say, I just want to register that. Uh, 
there need to be central accommodation. There needs to be central accommodation funding. There needs to be somebody who can protect people's uh, uh, personal information and an anonymity. And short of that, I think it's a human rights violation. Other questions or thoughts? Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. Um, so you showed a couple photos of recent building projects that, uh, you know, even though we're talking a lot about, about accessibility lately, you're using them as negative examples of being, you know, not very accessible. Um, I'm in Illinois and we are planning a building redesign. So I'm wondering if you have any positive examples of spaces in sure. the academic world currently that, you know, we could use, look to as models or maybe recommendations for how we can be make our voices heard in the planning process sure. so that the building that we build doesn't end up being, you know, one of those examples. Sure. Yeah, so uh, I complained enough on my campus that I actually got to be part of a planning committee for a new building, which was really interesting and depressing in its own way. Uh, but I I'll give you a couple examples. Syracuse University is building a veteran center, and it's, it's building it from the ground up with universal design principles. Uh, so the Veterans Resource Center at Syracuse, you can go online and have a look at those examples. And it's very simple stuff. It's, what's really interesting is that it's, it's halfway built now, and I was visiting Syracuse not that long ago. And so you see the structure, and the structure is built around ramps. So they've used, the, the ramps themselves are, are kind of like structural pillars for the, the way the building is going to be built. But obviously, if you're, if, if you're building for a Veterans Resource Center, it needs to be accessible. To me, the key is tying the argument for accessibility into the aesthetic um, and cultural arguments that the people making the building want to make. So on my own campus, that was to build a student space. So if you want to build a welcoming student space, my sense was build it around an elevator rather than, if it's going to be multi-level, build it around an elevator rather than around stairs. And, and there are lots of examples where elevators are kind of beautiful. We don't think of them that way, but they can be. Like a glass elevator that gives you different views and things like that can be truly beautiful. So this space is built around a series of tree houses that are accessible. They're not really tree houses. That's what they want to call them, right? But they're student study spaces that feel like tree houses that are accessible by a glass elevator. Uh, so, and that makes the central argument about access for everybody. Now, everybody is very happy that there's an elevator, and what it's replacing is an outdoor atrium that was full of those brutalist stairs I was talking about. Um, but I can give you lots of examples. The problem for me, and I'll just say this, the problem with a lot of universal design is that it does get held up as like the perfect porridge, but universities have one building that is universally designed. And they're very proud of it, but all the rest of the buildings continue to be totally inaccessible. And I said this to the people at Syracuse, I said this is wonderful for you to build this space for veterans and want to bring more veterans to their, your campus, but they're gonna get outside of that building and go to any other building on campus and not be able to access it. So it, you can't just, it can't just be this one flagship piece. Um, that said, you know, there's a lot of work to be done to, to make campuses more accessible. Well, that's one example I give you. Thank you. Um, I'm at the University of Chicago, and I saw your image from Northwestern, and I thought, oh my goodness, that's totally what had just happened at the Harris School of Public Policy, it's this big, like, <coughs> central terraced space. And one of the things that they were touting and was, like, making people walk. Um, and I'm sort of wondering, like, how, like, I hadn't actually thought about that space as you know, if you couldn't do stairs, it's pretty much like you can't do it. I mean, it's not that there's not an elevator in there, but it gets to that question of, like, back door versus front door, although I don't think it's quite as bad as, as the example that, that you showed from the University of Illinois. But I, I'm sort of wondering, like, how, how you balance some of those things, too. And, and, and this was a building that was retrofitted in a sense. It's, it wasn't built from the ground up. It was an existing building that they, they gutted a lot of things, so it wasn't, like... But but it had a framework in mind already, and I'm wondering how you balance some of that like desire like make students like be physically active with some of the um, you know need to also make spaces be accessible. Yeah, 
So again, under, filed under the theme of I complain about it enough and then they make me be part of the committee. I'm on my university's wellness committee, which I believe has a very, very narrow sense of what wellness is. And it actually operates more like a demand to be a certain type of body. I know the University of Wisconsin, which is a very hilly and step, lots of steps campus, there's like rewards for the number of steps or like contests for the number of steps, count your steps. Um, to me, it gets at this, this same logic, right, which is that there's only one way to be well, and that is to be hyper active, right, or be athletic or, or access the, the campus in a particular way. So I guess, you know, I would say get on those committees and complain more so that the models of, of how to be an active and contributing member of campus aren't those narrow, aren't, aren't that narrow. Um, but I just see that happening over and over again. And it's, the truth is the approach to disability on most, most campuses, we talk about disability all the time, but through a model of cure and rehabilitation, right? It's the idea of making disability go away rather than acknowledging that disability is an identity or that it's part of an experience that we'll all have, right? So I see those, <laughs> those you know, that, those types of initiatives as really part of that ableist culture. One of the best examples I can give is, you know, your school probably will have like a wellness week or a wellness day. And uh, one thing that happens on university campuses in Ontario is that there's a mental health day, right? And it really is about making mental unwellness go away. Right? But whatever messages we can provide for students as staff and faculty that show that, that, that there are other ways to be, I think are really valuable. So one, one example I would give is what structural changes could be made to, to create a more accessible space um, rather than downloading this responsibility for wellness onto individual students. Uh, what, what would actually make students more healthy on your campus? Do you know what I mean? Like as a, and the thing I always say at Waterloo, I'm going to keep saying it until they fire me, but it's like cut down on time tests and exams by half to begin, right? Or make, make individual professors prove why they're giving time tests and exams. That would increase wellness on university campuses. There could be other examples. You probably all could have your own, but like saying the big thing that people aren't going to say and that's going to be unpopular that would actually be something that would increase student health. Um, and there are other big structural changes that universities could make. Okay, I think we'll have to end it there. Thank you so much. Yeah. It's fantastic. Thank you.